This is the Israeli Merkava main battle tank. Its 120mm MG253 smoothbore cannon can fire multiple types of munitions on target 2,000 meters away while on the move thanks to its sophisticated fire control system. The development of the Merkava tank takes us through multiple wars and a unique period in Israel's history. It tells us a lot about how Israel's domestic military industrial complex became the powerhouse it is today. I want to find out what type of tactics and strategy work best with the Merkava in urban warfare. We'll also explore the vehicle's strengths and weaknesses. It's famously known as one of the heaviest and most well-protected ever built. Many open source numbers claim that it's 65 tons, but in reality, its latest version with the trophy protection system weighs 74.5 tons. That's equal to 42 Toyota Camrys. As you can see, Merkava tanks assembling outside Gaza were observed to be outfitted with brand new metal armor cages on top of the vehicle not seen in the past. These metal cages are designed to catch or slow down incoming kamikaze drones and bombs dropped from UAVs overhead. One Merkava tank was knocked out by Hamas during an overhead bombing attack during the October terror attacks. This is foreshadowing of what the Merkava could face inside the urban terrain in Gaza. A lot has changed since the last ground invasion in 2014, and drone attacks were one of the main shifts in tactics since then. The counter drone strategy was first deployed by the Russian military on top of their tanks to stop Ukrainian attack drones. Originally called cope cages, it was a term with a kind of negative connotation because the cages look like a low-tech ghetto rig solution to counter a high-tech problem. But since then, the cages have quickly become a standard operating procedure on tanks around the world. The idea for cage armor is actually not that new. It was on my striker when I deployed to Iraq over 10 years ago, and its first instances go all the way back to World War II. The Merkava tank has already reportedly entered into the Gaza Strip in small numbers. These tracked vehicles will lead the way as shock firepower. Tanks and urban warfare have a difficult history together because the tanks are vulnerable to RPG attacks in close quarters. Many started to think that tanks in city streets were a liability. I have a lot of military grade equipment that's built to last, which is why I chose the Ridge Men's Wedding Band Ring. The Ridge Ring is made from premium materials like carbon fiber, titanium, and 24 karat gold, so they're made to last a lifetime. Unlike when my rifle broke, Ridge offers a replacement ring. And unlike when my body armor plates stopped fitting because I packed on 10 pounds of pure pasta-fed muscle, Ridge offers a free resizing surface. From cooking to hunting, these rings are designed to be stylish and comfortable at the same time, thanks to its outer beveled edge and inner convex shape. It is a no-pinch fit. As many of you know, I recently proposed to my girlfriend Caitlin and she didn't even say no. And now their silicone rings have new available colors. Matte olive, royal black, alpine navy, gunmetal, and base camp orange. Just like their metal rings, they come with a silicone band and a travel case. So make the Ridge Ring a part of your everyday carry. To check it out yourself, just click the link in the description or head over to ridge.com slash task and purpose to see their wide selection. And make sure you use code task and purpose at checkout to get 10% off. But when used correctly, this isn't the case. They're the only weapons platform on the ground with the firepower necessary to destroy an enemy entrenched behind concrete. In an urban warfare environment, you can't live with them and you can't live without them. IDF Brigadier General Ibrahim is the commander of the IDF's Armored Corps. It's his entire job to make sure Israel's main battle tanks and tactics and strategy is ready for battle. In an interview with The Economist magazine, he said, quote, we no longer see the tanks as being capable of doing everything. The battlefield has changed. It's more crowded and built up. There are many challenges to these big platforms, and I expect the infantry and engineers to make up for my disadvantages." End quote. What's significant about the Merkava deployment towards Gaza right now is that for the first time in over four decades, the entire Israeli armored corps has been called up. This hasn't happened since 1982 with the war with Lebanon. So about 1,000 of these Merkava main battle tanks have been activated, many of which will head to cover the northern border. But where did Israel's tank strategy and design originally come from? In the year 1948, when Israel was first born, the country faced threats from 360 degrees, and the only tank that they had to defend themselves with was a vintage hand-me-down American M4 Sherman. These tanks helped Israel secure their independence, but they lack specific capabilities useful for Israel's purpose, namely armor and firepower. It had a relatively small 75mm cannon, for instance. However, 
Israel would quickly learn more about what kind of weapons they required, eight years later when they used the Shermans again in the 1956 Suez Crisis. Egypt invaded through the Sinai Desert, and this trial by fire saw the creation of the Israeli Armored Corps, which would become the building block of their modern military. In the 1960s, Israel started to gradually update their fleet with the US M48 Patton and British Centurion tanks. In 1966, the IDF started to evaluate the Royce Royce of tanks, which was the British chieftain. The goal here really was to one-up the Russian-based T-54 and T-55 that their adversaries flaunted. Because while the Western powers were supplying Israel with equipment, Russia was selling tanks to Egypt and Syria. Unfortunately, by 1967, Israel's neighbors weren't getting any friendlier towards them. In fact, they were showing clear signs that they were preparing themselves for another brawl. Britain, however, didn't want any of that drama, so they pulled the brakes on the tank deal. Moreover, France was also being difficult in the sale of heavy arms, something that drove home the realization that the Israeli Defense Forces could not simply rely on foreign powers for their armored needs. This leads us to the birth of the Israeli industrial complex and the uniqueness of their defense contractors. After Israel realized they couldn't rely on foreign weapons, they decided in 1970 to achieve independence in design and production. The first step was to establish the Israeli Tank and APC Administration under the Ministry of Defense. We have to consider that in the early days of its statehood, Israel's military industrial complex was more complex than industrial. They faced global economic downturns, the ripple effect of the 1973 oil crisis, and were still recovering from the costly aftermath of the Yom Kippur War. So after having to always fight for their lives with hand-me-down tanks from other countries, developing a world-class main battle tank in this context was like performing a high-wire act over a budgetary tightrope. And so the first project that they started was the Merkava main battle tank. One of the defining characteristics of Israel's military industrial complex was apparent right from the start. The tank idea went from drawing board to completion on schedule and under budget. This is unheard of in tank development. The Merkava program was originally assigned 100 million bucks by the Israeli parliament, but according to this CIA intelligence assessment that I dug up, they managed to execute it under budget with only 65 million and finish the project within the assigned time. So how did they pull this off without the all too common defense project cost overruns? The Armored Combat Vehicle Division of the Israeli Ministry of Defense developed it by keeping it in the family. The project was named Merkava, which stands for chariot in Hebrew. And the man named to lead the project that would become the backbone of the IDF's armored corps was Israel Tal, also known as Talik. Talik was an Israeli Defense Forces general who joined the British Army's Jewish Brigade at the age of 17. He served as a machine gunner in North Africa and Italy during the Second World War. After the war, he would later serve with distinction, holding different commands. The man was a maverick. He retired from active duty as the armor commander of Israel's Southern Front after refusing illegal orders to attack Egyptian forces once the Six-Day War had officially ended. For context, Talik, also nicknamed Mr. Armor, is a certified badass who's not only considered the father of Israeli armored doctrine, but has also been credited with shaping the Armored Corps into formations known for high mobility, relentless attacks, and an effective counter-Soviet doctrine that trained tank gunners to snipe at targets beyond 1.5 kilometers, or about 9.3 miles, which was three to five times further than the range their adversaries were trained to engage. This tactic had devastating consequences for the Arab armored columns. His feats earned him the honor of having his picture on the Pat Museum of Leadership Wall of Greatest Armor Commanders. Under Talik's leadership, Israel's development emphasized the use of homegrown technology, resources, and manpower, which not only reduced costs, but also fostered local industry growth. Today, under the Organization of the Israel Military Industries, IMI, the assembly is performed by the Israeli Ordnance Corps, and more than 90% of the Merkava components are produced locally in Israel by Israeli contractors. You could tell that Talik was an experienced commander who foresaw what we've observed in the Russo-Ukraine attritional war. Armor can be replaced, refurbished, or repaired, but the same cannot be said for experienced crews who can take months to be shaped into effective tankers. 
This is a major lesson for us to reflect on. You can always slam together new metal hulls, but you cannot infinitely replace manpower and experience. So at the heart of the Merkava's design philosophy is this uncompromising emphasis on crew safety. You see it everywhere. Unlike traditional tank designs, the Merkava positions its engine at the front, effectively utilizing it as a protective barrier against frontal assaults. This innovative approach minimizes the risk to personnel inside, enhancing survivability in combat situations. I already hear some people shouting, but wait, putting the engine in the front sounds like a great way to make yourself open to a mobility kill. Yes, I hear you. Mobility kill is a fancy word to say that your tank can no longer move because it was hit in the part that goes vroom vroom. However, this design choice has positive trade-offs for crew survivability because studies have shown that 60% of enemy fire is concentrated on the front of the tank. So having the engine block between the hull and the crew compartment was seen as having another shield behind the armor. That's why there's a big clam hedge on the back of the tank to get out the back in case of being hit or to rapidly reload while under heavy fire because they're so good at sniping adversaries before they get within their own effective range that these tanks are known to rapidly burn through their ammo. An additional advantage of having this large compartment in the back is that the crew can use it as living space for those hurry up and wait scenarios, so they don't have to step outside to stretch their legs as much. This is why the early versions of the Merkava sort of blurred the link between a tank and an IFV, an infantry fighting vehicle. This large common area for all personnel allows the driver to be pulled out by his comrades from the inside in case of a frontal hit and improves communications between the commander and the rest of the crew, which in turn helps everyone take care of one another. So much room for activities. The Merkava was originally designed to carry 62 shells of ammunition and another spot for an extra 25 shells topping the tank stores to 88 munitions. Another design choice also underscores how a country that had at the time less than 4 million people values trained crewmen. For example, because Israel did not have access to the British technology of Chobin armor to survive high explosive anti-tank or heat rounds, the designers made a completely counterintuitive move by completely encircling the tank with hollow self-sealing structures where they store everything from fuel to water, which helps diffuse the energy of a heat round. As well as we'll see later on, aside from survivability, other design criteria included rapid repair of battle damage, cost effectiveness, and off-road performance, which were perfected as the tank was progressively deployed, which brings us to Mark I, the evolution begins. This is the Merkava One. The original version entered service in 1979, about nine years after its development had begun. And we're gonna see how its evolution over the next four variants has been in response directly to the threats that they face from Hamas, Hezbollah, and other adversaries. One of the visual distinguishing features that has always been a part of the tank is the turret was designed with rounded facings. The whole turret had a very low profile which made the tank difficult to spot or hit at long distances. The Merkava has an unusually low silhouette. This wasn't just a tank, it was a steel promise of self-reliance tailored specifically to the needs of the IDF. It was a combo platter of triangular flat turret, armor protection cells installed on both sides of the gun, sporting an American-inspired M64 105mm rifled tank gun. They strapped on not one, but two variants of the Belgian FN Mag 7.62mm general purpose machine gun, an external 60mm Israeli Sultan mortar with rounds for illumination, anti-personnel, and smoke in case they needed to skedaddle right out of there. This beast had flexible reconfiguration options, a vertical double coil spring, suspension powered by a Continental V12 908 horsepower engine which purred with an American Alston transmission that gave this first iteration an operational range of 400 to 500 kilometers or about 250 to 310 miles. And it had a maximum road speed of 46 kilometers per hour, which is about 29 miles an hour. The Merkava's turret curves interestingly, and inside it's fitted with MBC protection. So it's uh, fitted against like biological weapons and nuclear fallout. And it has an automatic fire extinguishing system 
that's standard. The Merkava Mark I was among the world's most protected tanks when it was first introduced. However, in spite of its groundbreaking 2.5 generation design, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. Despite its swagger, the Mark I had its share of could be better moments. Still, it was more than a tank. It was a rolling manifesto of Israel's ingenuity and independence. It had its baptism of fire during the 1982 Lebanon War, also known as Operation Peace for Galil, where it saw its first major combat. Despite facing challenges like RPGs and anti-tank guided munitions, the tank's effective armor layout proved superior. And when it came across the feared Soviet T-72, a Warsaw Pact officer would later confess they were shocked to read how the Merkava destroyed many T-72s compared to other IDF tanks like the M60 and French LMX. Based on the action that the original Merkava tank saw, in Lebanon, they decided to upgrade the vehicle to address any perceived weaknesses that appeared. This is where the Merkava Mark II came from, which was largely a technological-focused upgrade, because remember, at this time, in the 1980s, computer technology and sensors were rapidly improving. The distinguishing factor for tank improvement is frequently what's under the hood. This is why the Merkava Mark II would be fitted with thermal optics, night vision, and updates to its fire control computer. This system is what basically auto-aims for the gunner. You still need a good gunner who has the skills to operate the tech and knows how to lock onto targets and train the weapon, but it does the aiming calculations that in the past needed to slowly be done on paper. Merkava II tanks could now fire its machine gun from a remote weapon system, so the operator was kept under the safety of armor. They also swapped the American Allenson transmission for an Israeli-made automatic and expanded the fuel storage to let this beast travel further without refueling, so that took down less load on the logistics that you need, because Israel, as we know, their main doctrine is to get in there and finish the job decisively and quickly, so they want that tank to have a full tank of gas and be able to just go. Feedback from the crews and after battle analysis contributed to the new special armor modules installed in the turret, sides, and skirt. In addition to the signature chains with metal balls in the rear of the turret for added protection against anti-tank guided missiles and RPG rounds. These chains were placed here because a rocket fired at that space between the turret and the hull is devastating for any tank. It's the main weak point of tanks. During tests, this simple solution proved to be effective against foot soldiers with handheld rockets to attack from behind. The tank was also given an improved laser rangefinder with crosswind analyzers, putting it up to par with the US M60S, which was the benchmark back then. These enhancements also mark this trend of meticulously studying the tank's performance after each operation to identify vulnerabilities in the Mark I which had influenced a special focus on optimization for urban warfare and low intensity conflicts. Because in a lot of cases, they're not going up against other tanks, they're going up against foot soldiers. The Mark III and Israeli R&D teams had this obsession with statistics and after battle reports. So the Markava Mark III rolled out in December 1989 but have subsequent upgrades that made it the most numerous model in the IDF's inventory. This tank saw it all. For example, as soon as it entered service, over the course of the next following 15 years, iterations of the Merkava Mark III were sent into southern Lebanon, a terrain full of hills and not the friendliest for heavy armor maneuvering. The Merkava Mark III faced threats from Hezbollah guerrillas skilled in hit-and-run tactics and ambushes in the hills of the Lebanese-Israeli border. They used Soviet-made wire-guided missiles, like the Soviet Sager missile, reported to have taken out of action at least three tanks. It was a guerrilla warfare nightmare, where defeating your enemy before they could launch a rocket was half the battle. At the same time, the Mark III had to face a completely different battlefield in the first Intifada from 1987 to 1993. It was ill-suited for urban asymmetric warfare that it encountered. Rather than facing traditional combat threats, these ironclad beasts grappled with civilian-led resistance, including IEDs, Molotov cocktails, and the rare RPG. By incorporating the lessons gained from the previous scenarios, post-war analysis indicated that the tank's protective measures had evolved effectively and its evolution highlighted the constant arms race between armor and anti-tank weaponry. 
but that it needed to take measures to face close range threats in a 360 degree environment. These lessons started to translate into major upgrades like a more powerful Continental 1200 HP air-cooled diesel engine and the locally developed IMI 120mm gun, a real game changer in firepower. For the first time, the tank was considerably upgunned. These changes beefed its weight up to 65 tons, but thanks to the better engine, it could still hit 60 kilometers per hour. And who doesn't like going pedal to the metal in a tank? The Mark III-D, the last of the Mark III series, introduced an independent, fully stabilized panoramic commander's sight, allowing what's called hunter-killer ability, with advanced thermal imagers for both gunner and commander. The Mark III effectiveness influenced the IDF's decision to retire other tanks still in the armored fleet, like the Centurion tank and the M60S, in favor of an exclusive Merkava force, a process that would be completed in 2005 with the introduction of the Mark IV. It's basically like in Toy Story where Andy discarded the old toys in favor of the newer cool ones. Enter the Merkava Mark IV. Introduced in 2004, it was similar to its predecessors, but on steroids. It boasted a state-of-the-art fire control system, making it a sharpshooter on the move with a stabilized turret and something else specifically designed to keep you cool instead of extra crispy, the trophy protection system, which could detect and neutralize incoming missiles like a shotgun fly swatter, but for anti-tank missiles and those pesky RPGs. It's an active protection system that's designed to protect vehicles from anti-tank guided missiles, RPGs, anti-tank rockets, and high explosive anti-tank rounds. It has a hit rate of over 95% with 360 degrees protection. It's equipped with four to 12 interceptors inside its magazine. It's like a bodyguard for your tank that's always on high alert and ready to take down an incoming threat. It's an automated system, so you don't have to do anything. It just engages multiple threats in rapid succession without needing to be reloaded. It weighs between one and two tons and can cost a few million bucks, but I think it's well worth it. When an incoming projectile is detected, Trophy's internal computer calculates the approach vector before the projectile arrives. Once the incoming weapon is classified, the computer calculates the optimal time and angle to fire the countermeasure. The response comes from two rotating launchers installed on the side of the vehicle, which fire a very small number of multiple explosive form penetrators that form a very tight, precise matrix aimed at a specific point on the anti-tank projectile's warhead. Well, it's like a swarm of angry bees attacking a single target with pinpoint accuracy in milliseconds. This isn't to say it doesn't have its limitations. It's not perfect, but it's an innovative solution. The system is designed to have a very small kill zone so that it doesn't endanger personnel near the protected vehicle if you're standing outside the tank when this thing goes off. You don't want to save your vehicle while accidentally peppering the squad providing support right outside your vehicle. But what about the latest tank, the Merkava 5? They upgraded the 120mm MG25 smoothbore gun that had a capacity of 46 rounds that were five ready in the mechanical drum to the new MG253 that has 48 round capacity and 10 are ready in the electrical drum while still being able to carry six infantrymen in full battle rattle. So can it get any better? Well, yes it can. The Iron Vision helmet mounted display system Unveiled in July 2018, it's a helmet-mounted augmented reality system that uses high-resolution cameras around the tank to provide a 360 virtual reality view of the surroundings to crew members' helmet displays while protected inside. Because one of the biggest downsides of being in an armored vehicle, I can tell you from personal experience, having been a mechanized infantry, is when you're inside the hole, you have no idea what's going on outside. So this piece of gear was developed by the same Israeli company behind the equivalent system on the F-35 fighter aircraft. So with the Merkava Mark IV being among the top five heaviest tanks in the world, how exactly do you deploy this beast and what are its logistics? To start, it's important to point out that the Merkava was deployed with the sole purpose of defending Israel in its specific territory. So because the tank doesn't need to be airlifted or cross European planes or frail bridges with weight limits, its deployment has already been optimized. It's part of a complex process involving not just the tank itself, but the integration of various aspects of the IDF's combined arms, including network-centric approach to modern warfare through this cockpit system. 
It leverages AI for advanced battlefield awareness and decision making. So it integrates the tank into Israel's broader defense network and it ensures that its logistics are similarly sophisticated so the tank can be maintained, supplied, and effectively utilized in conjunction with other arms like aircraft and bombs overhead in a variety of scenarios. It's now deployed in its state-of-the-art brand new fifth generation variant, the Barak. In terms of design, the Merkava 5 closely mirrors its predecessor, the Merkava 4. The Merkava is expected to fight defensive battles in combined arms warfare in conjunction with other units to achieve battlefield objectives in an AI-assisted network-centric battlefield that will be able to perform tasks that previously required an entire company or platoon of armored vehicles. With their advanced connectivity capabilities, barrack tanks will provide real-time intelligence about targets while on the move, both for themselves and for nearby forces, enhancing survivability and defensive capabilities. This particular evolution appears to be more in line with being able to exploit vulnerabilities at superhuman speed, basically by sensing and front-end processing capabilities based on artificial intelligence. The Merkava main battle tank will be critical to the IDF in what's about to come. In the context of the recent conflict with Hamas, the Merkava is especially important because it gives the IDF a significant advantage in urban warfare. Hamas militants are likely to fight from fortified positions in densely populated areas, which can make it difficult for the IDF to engage them with artillery and airstrikes. The Merkava's heavy armor and maneuverability make it well suited for close quarters combat in urban environments. In addition, the Merkava's ability to evacuate casualties from the front is important in context of urban warfare, where there's a high risk of casualties. The Merkava will most likely be used in brutal house-to-house -house combat to help clear urban areas of Hamas militants, not only by breaching enemy fortifications and supporting infantry troops, but also to identify targets for them, provide fire support for artillery and airstrikes, and envelop nearby units within its protective bubble that the new variant of the Mark V provides. Moreover, its rear access will help carry personnel to the front as well as help wounded egress the battle space when they're stabilized. In the long term, the Merkava's new variants and continual upgrades are but a reflection of the Israeli commitment to self-reliance and technological advancement, further solidifying its deterrent stature. It showcases their ability to innovate and maintain a technological edge. Israel projects a glimpse into the future of warfare, a future where Good intelligence and information will be wielded as defensive and offensive weapons that will serve a purpose in economy of force and the definition of a new meaning of how war will be waged while protecting and assisting highly skilled and specialized warriors. So what do you think? Let me know what your thoughts on the Merkava's unique capabilities for urban warfare are. What about their planned use of AI? Do you agree or disagree with the points I've made? I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments section. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Follow me at Cappy Army for updates on these weapon systems and the evolving conflict. That's C-A-P-P-Y Army on Instagram. Check out some of our other videos while you're here, and I'll see you guys in a few days.